Xander mentioned, uh, I'm Peter Schwartz. I have the uh, privilege of being a trustee of Long Now, and uh, Stuart is tonight at TED. We're having a much more, much better time here than uh, I think Stuart is probably down at TED. We've got a much more interesting speaker than they do. Uh, uh, I, I, uh, I have uh, really a great privilege. As many of you know, uh, uh, I have been interested in the subject of climate change for a long time, uh, and uh, particularly how climate change affects human societies. And in fact, my first climate study was back in 1977 when the issue was global cooling. Uh, and we did our study uh, just as the world was turning. We were at a tipping point when the world started warming again. It had warmed from 1895 roughly till about 1960 and then cooled till about 75. The big question was, were we headed into another little ice age? Um, were we headed for another much colder future. Well, it turned out, no, we weren't. We were just going in a new direction, which is the direction we're going in now. But that began to lead me to uh, uh, interesting questions about where the climate was going. But the truth is that one of the things I didn't really understand was how human societies had, in fact, wrestled with this issue many times in the past. And then a number of years ago, in the, the pursuit of the books for the GBN Book Club, I happened to read a book called The Little Ice Age by Brian Fagan and discovered, in fact, that at least one person had been exploring over a very long period of time how, in fact, in fact, for 400,000 years, and particularly the last few thousand years, how climate and society have interacted, how people have adapted to climate change. Uh, and that man, of course, was Brian Fagan. Uh, Brian uh, recently retired as a professor at UC, Ber uh, UC Santa Barbara uh, from the anthropology department where he studied, he was a professor of archaeology uh, looking at the ancient societies. Uh, Brian's also, he tells me, a, 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 a serious sailor uh, and that a lot of his insights have come from his experiences on the sea and those of us who have the privilege of sailing know that it is a very powerful teacher um, and uh, we share that experience uh, with Brian. Uh, let me mention one other thing before I hand over. Uh, some of you will know that uh, uh, last Friday uh, we at GBN published a new report on climate change and national security. If you're interested in the subject you can go to uh, the GBN website, it's available there uh, and it's uh, raising some interesting questions of where the climate is going in the not too distant future. And with that, oh yes, uh, questions. So uh, the, as you came in, you were given this little card. On the back is the space for questions. We will have people collecting questions, is that right? During the course of the evening. Uh, bring them, we'll bring them forward and uh, we will then pose uh, a few questions to Brian at the end of the evening. Over to you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I must say I'm very impressed to see such a huge audience in the new venue on a Friday night. The last lecture I gave was at MIT and just before I went to the lecture there was a reception beforehand and I heard two people saying, are you going to go and hear Fagan? And the other guy said, hell no, I'm going to go and have a drink. <laughs> so if anyone wants to leave and have a drink, now is the moment. It's a great privilege to be here to talk about something that there's been a strange reluctance to talk about on the part of archaeologists and historians, and that is climate change. About 10 years ago, I embarked on a project which Stuart just mentioned to write a book on the Little Ice Age, which was a period of very unpredictable, often colder climate from about 1300 to 1860 AD. And I wrote to a very eminent historian and said, because I knew nothing about the literature, can you give me a few guides as to climate change? Who's writing about it? And he wrote to me and said, huh? Nobody's thought about that since at least 1970. He was wrong. There were all sorts of people looking at it, but they weren't looking at it so much from the very long view. They were looking at it more from the perspective of detail. For example, a remarkable French historian, Emmanuel Leroy Ladery, wrote a book on the dates of wine harvests, because each fall the authorities in different villages would decide on the day of the harvest. And if you have good rains and good weather, the harvest is early. If you have poor weather, the harvest is late. And they have measured 
climate change over many centuries since then. And there are historians out now who are making their living studying wine harvests. But it's a very, very specialized world. And what I want to do this evening is take a wide view and a long view. Because another thing in his great wisdom that Leroy Ladurie did, and I wish I'd met him, he must have been lovely, he described two types of historians in classically French prose. There are, as it were, the parachutists, who parachute gently to earth and survey the broad landscape of history. And then, as it were, the rather truffle hunters who grub in the soil and fascinate themselves with minute detail. That's archaeologists for you. What I want to do today is to be a parachutist. And I want to start by taking you to the Middle Zambezi Valley in Africa. And I want you to imagine the fall. The days are getting hotter and hotter and stickier and stickier. And day after day, the sun shines out of a brazen sky, dust rising from the ground which is completely parched. And the men and women are out there hoeing the fields and clearing the brush. They burn the brush. Let it fall on the fields to fertilize them. And then every day it gets hotter and hotter. Think 105 degrees. And in the middle of the day, people sit in the shelter of their houses and do not move. If you move a finger, you sweat. It's that hot. And it gets hotter and hotter. And every afternoon, massive black clouds mount in the western horizon. And every day they get closer and closer. And you can feel the tension. And tempers flare. And then one day, the clouds come close. And there are clacks of thunder and a few raindrops. And then the deluge comes. And you can feel the tension evaporate out of the ground as the, wind, the temperature falls by about 20 degrees. And when the rain is gone, they make a decision to plant. And they plant. And then they wait, and they wait, and they wait. And if they're lucky, it rains. But a lot of the time, it doesn't rain. And they wait. And the crops wither in the fields. Or it rains five miles away, and their neighbors have, have plants, our crops, and they do not. And all too often, among subsistence farmers, the fate is drought. This is a lecture about, among other things, drought. But it's also about some realities of ancient climate in the long term. We have, in many senses, been there before. This is a graph from an ice core dug near the Vostok Antarctic Station in Antarctica. It covers 400,000 years. And it shows the CO2 levels, high with the cold, low with the warm. Look at the fluctuation. Right up till today. The world's climate over the last 780,000 years has been in a transition from warm to cold, for, or cold to warm, for over 75% of the time. The longest period of relatively stable climate has been since the last ice age ended 15,000 years ago. There is, ladies and gentlemen, only one way you can look at climate, and that is in the long haul. And from my point of view, you can talk as much as you like about global warming and all the rest. But in the final analysis, the most important thing to us is the impact of it on people. 
And that's the perspective I'm going to give you this evening. About 15,000 years ago, warming began. It was at first hesitant. There were considerable fluctuations. But warming happened very, very rapidly. People don't realize, firstly, how few people there were in the world 15,000 years ago. And secondly, how different the world was. Global sea levels were 300 feet lower than they are today. Huge ice sheets covered North America, much of Scandinavia, and the Alps. Most of Central Europe, and right across to Siberia, was treeless steppe tundra. But as the warming happened, the sea levels rose, Alaska was severed from Siberia. England was no longer part of the continent, thank goodness. <laughs> the continental shelves off Southeast Asia and elsewhere went under the ocean. And the vegetational zones changed dramatically. But, and here is our first lesson from the past, it wasn't all warming. In Southwest Asia, at the end of the Ice Age, the environment was wetter and much better watered than it is today. Today's degradation, of course, in part, is due to intensive herding of animals. But this strip you can see there in dark was a strip of extremely nice mixed oak woodland which every fall yielded enormous harvests of acorns, pecans, and other edible plants. So much so that in this area, the hunter-gatherers who could live there settled down and lived in permanent settlements, something that is almost unheard of for hunter-gatherers except in areas of exceptional resource abundance like this. But then, on the other side of the world, a really dramatic event occurred. In northern Canada, ice sheets were retreating across what is now Canada. In the height of the Ice Age, they had extended right down to the Great Lakes. And as they retreated, they formed a huge, and there you can see it in black, glacial lake. Here's a large amount of it. Much of it is in Lake Winnipeg today. And suddenly, about 11,000 BC, that lake burst its banks and billions of liters of water flowed, fresh water, beautifully fresh water, flowed into the North Atlantic and cascaded across the surface of the salty ocean. The effect was to shut down, at least partially, the Gulf Stream, which brought warm temperatures to Europe. And within a generation, they think, much of Europe was plunged back into near glacial conditions. Now in Europe, there was a sparse population of reindeer hunters who simply adjusted to the conditions by moving. But in Southwest Asia, where the oak forests were thick and people were living in permanent villages, the situation was very different. As the drought intensified, and I'm talking here about a thousand year drought period, not 20 years, the forests retreated or thinned out. The people then turned to wild plant foods, grasses. But those grasses became rarer. And in a fascinating archaeological site in Syria, they have used samples of seeds to show that the people adapted by firstly eating a much wider range of plant foods and secondly by beginning to plant seeds, deliberately trying to expand the range the availability of edible grasses 
They were desperately trying to preserve their traditional hunter-gatherer lifeway. But instead, genetic changes in the crops were such that they became farmers. Within a few generations, within a thousand years, some of these farmers were living in walled towns like the one of Jericho here. The economies spread rapidly. People were now settled in villages and anchored to their lands. And when you're anchored to your lands, your whole dynamic changes. Imagine that this is a village and we are living in it cheek by jowl in small houses built of mud brick with courtyards and narrow alleyways and flat roofs. And during the long winter, tempers flare. You cannot move. So you have to develop entirely new relationships with people. And you have to develop relationships with neighboring villages. So if your crops fail, your relatives can bail you out. And you have an entirely new relationship too with the land. Because you are very, very vulnerable now. Because you can't move away from your fields because your fields feed you. And you've cleared the land and the wild plant foods are no longer available. And what becomes terribly important are your ancestors because life is governed by the eternal cycle of the seasons. Spring with the plowing and the planting. Summer with the growth and the adulthood. Fall, the harvest and winter, death. Just like human existence. And farmers assumed that their lives would continue the same. Their long view of humanity was that it would be the same and that we would live like our ancestors did and future generations would live like we did. And this is a very adaptable way to live if you are a subsistence farmer because you depend on each other and you depend on the ancestors. Why the ancestors? Because the ancestors are you spiritually who have gone to the supernatural world, who are people you knew, who are intermediaries to the spiritual world, who are the guardians of the land. And I'll never forget in Africa, in the Gain in the Zambezi Valley, night after night, hearing the drums beat. And they would beat from dusk until dawn. They would beat when somebody died, when they would chase the spirit of that person into the bush to wander for a year. And then after a year they would drum again and they would summon the spirit back to become one of the revered ancestors. And I vividly remember once going to a village meeting to get permission to dig a hole in an archaeological site. And it was just like a board meeting here. And the village elders were there. But before we began, began the village spirit medium stood up and invoked the ancestors, and clapped his hands to get the blessing of the ancestors on the enterprise. So we dug with the blessing of the ancestors. They were the guardians of the land. I've gone on rather long about this because it's very important to realize that enormous numbers of people in today's world are living at the subsistence level often in marginal lands. And they are the hidden elephants in the room when we talk about the long future of climate change. People have adjusted to climate crises of various sorts for thousands of years. I could give you example after example. The one I'm going to give you, though, is one from ancient Egypt. You can't give a lecture on archaeology without talking about Egypt. People get upset if you don't talk about it. <laughs> 3,000 years ago, ancient Egyptian civilization came into being with the unification of Egypt as a single linear kingdom along the Nile. And we embarked on the Old Kingdom which was the first great period of Egyptian civilization, marked, of course, by an orgy 
of pyramid building. No, ladies and gentlemen, I am not going to talk about pyramid power and its cosmic presence. I'm just saying that those were built by pharaohs who used religious ideology to perpetuate the notion that they were gods on earth and that they were infallible. And one of the big sores that every school student reads and hears about is the notion that ancient Egyptian civilization was nourished by the floods of the Nile. Every year in the summer, the flood would come up, would water the land, and then the flood would recede, and the people would plant, and there would be plenty to eat, and ancient Egyptian civilization, with all its panoply of glory, flourished for thousands of years. Wrong. You may not be aware of it, but the difference between a high and a low flood on the Nile is a matter of a few meters. And Egypt was always vulnerable to two things. One was excessive floods, which would <coughs> flood everything, wipe out entire villages, do great destruction, destroy centuries of irrigation work in a few days. Or, just as bad, drought. Because the Nile is like an arrow shot through the desert. The floodplain is fertile if it is watered. If it is not, it is desert. And the old kingdom pharaohs preached that they were the great gods and that they controlled the destiny of the Nile. They controlled the flood. And then in 2180 BC, just after a pharaoh called Pepi II died after reigning for 67 years, like Ramesses II, he was long-lived, the Nile flood failed. And there are graphic accounts of how the Nile dried up in Upper Egypt. People could walk across the river. There was rioting. People starved. People wandered aimlessly in search of food. And people turned to the pharaoh and said, food, please. You've got it. You're the god. And of course he didn't. And Egypt collapsed for a hundred years. It collapsed into small, contingent parts. And the people who kept it going were the provincial governors, like this gentleman here, who ruled resolutely. They knew their villages. And they shut their boundaries. They built dams. They planted on sandbanks in the river. They prevented people moving. They rationed food. And the people survived without the pharaoh. How do we know this? Because their burial inscriptions in their tombs have been preserved. And one of them, a man called Ketty, saying, I saved the people with my bold actions, just like a modern-day politician. But he did. And the lesson from this was that resolute leadership saved the day. And in the final analysis, if you look at climate change in the long term, if you're a subsistence farmer, the thing that keeps you going is not a central government. It is the links of your village, your family, your ties to the land. Because that's where you're least vulnerable. There are innumerable cases of climate change. Some of them produced by volcanic eruptions, as of course is Vesuvius, which wiped out Pompeii at least twice. Or you can take another example from the Andes. This is the Moche River on the coast of Peru. Some of the driest, most arid land in the world. But through it flow fertile river valleys which are watered by mountain runoff from the Andes. And it was here in the last 2,000 years that a series of remarkable wealthy states arose based on two things. One was the harvest of anchovies from the natural upwelling off the Pacific coast caused by the north-flowing cold Humboldt current. And the second was intensive irrigation agriculture in the river valleys using mountain 
runoff. And the people who lived there became real experts at water conservation. And the most famous of all these societies, which flourished during the first millennium AD, was a civilization based on these pyramids here, which was called the Moche. Basically, it was a series of petty kingdoms ruled by people who were are called by archaeologists warrior priests. In AD 400, a warrior priest or a series of them died. And by a fortunate accident in 1989, these burials were recovered before looters could get at them. And from them, we have a portrait of the men who ruled this society, which is very informative if you look at climate change. This is one of the lords of Sipan in Peru. He is dressed, this is a replica, of course, in his formal regalia. I want you to imagine the pyramid I just showed you. Not a ruin, but plastered and painted a brilliant white with plazas underneath, and the plazas full of a crowd of people. Drums are beating. Incense is flowing. People are chanting. And then suddenly, as the sun is setting, there is silence. And everybody looks up to the teeny temple on the top of the pyramid. And suddenly, he appears, and the sun glitters off his headdress. He is the living God. The living, infallible God who controlled the destiny of people. <coughs> now again, I want to come back to today's world. We have, unless you're a reborn Christian, an enormously long perspective on human existence. Two, three, four, five, six million years. We certainly have, with the long life expectancies we have, a long generational memory. I once met an Irish archaeologist whose grandfather had met a woman who had seen the French land in Ireland in 1790. My, I met last year a man who was in his 90s who had heard Adolf Hitler speak in the flesh. My great-grandfather was in the Crimean War, just, for a long-lived family. The life expectancy of the Moche was about 28, 30. The life of a medieval peasant in Europe, 24, 25 years. Your whole perspective on life, on philosophy, on climate change is totally different because has happened here. Major El Ninos happened maybe once or twice a century. And these men, and here's a brilliant portrait of one of them on a pot, preached, we think, that they were the supreme gods. They weren't literate. But look at the face. Look at the arrogance. Look at the boldness of the man. He's looking into the distance. He was a god, and he knew it. And society was very rigid, and the number of people who had wealth, who had power, were very small, small numbers of families. And when a major El Nino hit this area, and it did, huge hundred-year floods, because El Ninos here bring rain, combined with some earthquakes, combined with the countercurrent of El Nino, which cut off the anchovy fishery, literally destroyed the fabric of that civilization in a few days. The warrior priests regrouped. But within two centuries, their society was gone. It was simply too rigid to adapt. What I'm talking about really 
and I'm going to talk about more now, is subsistence farming. I want to remind you that even today, enormous numbers of humanity, and this isn't us, and the hardest problem I have teaching students, and I'm very thrilled a couple of my former students are here this evening, the one thing I have always had a problem teaching them is that not everybody buys food in supermarkets. You laugh, but I'm deadly serious. They live from harvest to harvest, from day to day, and they have a life unimaginably different to ours. What governs that life? The cycles of the season. This is a gentleman called Hubert Lamb. He looks, he was wearing the classic dress of a distinguished university professor in Britain. He was a lovely man. He was a meteorological detective. His specialty was the history of climate change over the last 4,000 years or so. And he did this back in the 60s, when nobody really thought about climate, and historians really ignored him. He was one of the great heroes. And what he did was take fragmentary historical records, like, for example, the diary of a country priest, logs from naval captains, records of agricultural activity, records of vineyards, and from this, he said, there was perhaps a medieval warm period, a period of somewhat warmer, more stable climate between about A.D. 800 and 1200. And he called this the medieval warm period. It was a time, and this is very important to realize, and a lot of people don't realize this, that the whole of Europe virtually at that time was in subsistence farming and lived from one harvest to the next. This, of course, is a Peter Bruegel painting, which paints a very idyllic picture of a harvest in a good year. And by piecing this together, he produced some remarkable information. For example, he pointed out that vineyards flourished not only in Europe, but in Britain. This is Gloucestershire by the River Severn, beautiful country. If you haven't been there, go there and try the cheese. I'm not joking, it's wonderful. But in 1130, a monk, William of Malmesbury, traveled through here and said, words to the effect, the wine here was wonderful. And it isn't too bitter and it's not too sweet. And vineyards in England were so productive and so good, they were exporting wine to France. And the French were bitching because the market was being saturated with English wine. Have you tasted English wine? <laughs> Actually, some of it's pretty good. But in those days, they were growing wine in central England. Today, they're growing it in the south, and that's it. But not only that, but they were growing cereal crops in parts of Scandinavia even in Iceland. Snow levels were higher than they are today. So he defined very tentatively, this guy was a good scholar. He said, I think there was a warmer period. I can't really pin it down, but I think there was. And it lasted from AD 800 to 1250. Higher snow lines, Longer growing seasons, which is very important in much of Europe, where cereal crops can be tricky, and during the Little Ice Age, when it got colder, they were. Slightly higher summer temperatures and drier warm months, which are very good for growing crops. And wine was grown in England and northern Germany. And this, he said, was followed by a Little Ice Age. I love this picture. <laughs> and the Little Ice Age, people think of a deep freeze. In fact, it was a period of extremely volatile, changeable climate, which included, particularly in the 17th century, some pretty cold weather. And there is evidence 
which I'll show you in a moment. In fact, I will show you now and go back that the Thames flooded. And there's the famous thing which every English school student learns about of the parties on the Thames which froze over. The Thames didn't freeze over after about 1750, one of the reasons being they were building bridges. But it's the classic image of the Little Ice Age. In fact, the Little Ice Age was very much more volatile than that. And it began in 18, uh, 1315. And this is where we get back to subsistence farming. In 1315, they planted crops after Easter. And almost immediately after they planted them, and this was after a couple of centuries of pretty good harvests, and a lot of expansion, a lot more people, it started to rain. And it rained, and it rained, and it rained. By Christmas, there was hunger. And for seven years, it rained, and the crops failed. Between one and a half and 1.8 million people died as a result of famine, and particularly famine-related diseases, as a result of these seven years, which gives you some idea of the vulnerability of medieval Europeans to climate change. But if you look at this on the long term, you're very much looking at a rather limited picture. What Hubert Lamb called church steeple meteorology. Imagine a world like the medieval world, or think of the Norse, the Vikings. How would they know when a storm was coming? All they had was either the view from the top of their mast or from the church of a church steeple, which meant they maybe, at the most, would have a day's warning of the weather that was coming. Today, we have computer models and we have all this thing. It is amazing that people survived at all. Because the great myth of the medieval warm period was that it was a warm period. It wasn't. It was partially warm. Because, like all these things do in academic life, the medieval warm period became a finite period in history, 800 to 1200. Hubert Lamb said it was the medieval warm period, therefore it was the medieval warm period, and it poured into the literature. But at the same time, unfortunately for us, a revolution in climatology has completely changed our perceptions of how humans in the past adapted to climate change. Ice cores, tree rings, fossil pollens, deep sea cores, lake cores. And from this is a completely different view of the medieval warm period. And of course, this whole thing has got wrapped up in the controversies over anthropogenic global warming. If you look at climate change in the long haul, you would accept the fact that humans have adjusted to global warming again and again, if you look at the perspective of 400,000 years. Now we've got the conceptual and the uh, scientific tools to look at these changes much more thoroughly. And many of these changes are now studied by what are called proxies, indirect indications tree rings, deep sea cores, and so on. And here is the record since pretty early on in the medieval warm period, the temperature anomaly minus and plus over the last thousand years or more. And notice that the black line, which is the instrument record, only goes back about 150 years. Before that, it's all proxy. And look at all the different proxies there are. And notice the only thing that everyone agrees on is a steady upward climb since 1860. I don't think there's any reputable scientist around, or very few now, who do not believe that humanity has a major stake to play in this. And I just want to say I am sick and tired of the celebrated case of the hockey stick. <laughs> 
the diagram which says this is like a hockey stick and from there people say ah it was warmer during the medieval warm period and there's been this endless debate as to whether temperatures were higher a thousand years ago or not ladies and gentlemen it doesn't matter a because before about a thousand AD proxies still are very incomplete and secondly it's academic because the temperatures probably were lower and what matters is we have warming it doesn't matter how much this warming is relative to a thousand years ago because history ain't going to repeat itself so I think a lot of the debate about the hockey stick is not interesting what is however interesting is the benefits or otherwise of the medieval warm period as I said Europe at the time was a subsistence continent people lived from harvest to harvest from year to year the crop yields were astoundingly small compared with today except near towns like London where there was much more intensive production of crops and as a result hunger was on everybody's mind no farmer went through life or his family without suffering from at some point malnutrition or hunger and as Hubert Lamb pointed out and people ignored the medieval warm period in fact was a period of very volatile climate yes during 1100 to about 1200 1300 there was a period of relatively stable climate and that was the period when there was a huge growth in medieval population but that didn't alter the fact that most farming was low-tech the plowing was done with simple prong or moldboard plows the seed was scattered and then they would drive a horse or an ox towing a harrow over the strip farm the strip field to cover the grain and you were completely at the mercy of rainfall most years during the 11 and 1200s the harvest was pretty good but there were other hazards too you would gather the harvest you would stack it let it dry and hope you would get it under cover before it rotted over the rain life was unremittingly hard this famous painting of a peasant woman by Bruegel she was probably no longer not much older than about 25 life expectancy on a Winchester peasant in the estates in Winchester was 24 years the life of a medieval fisherman was estimated at 28 if that people lived with their cattle in very unsanitary conditions and they lived by the seasons imagine a society in which all knowledge was transmitted from one generation to the next almost entirely verbally where life expectancy was short where child mortalities were huge where cattle diseases were endemic where people had every parasite imaginable where in the winter everybody huddled around a fire and the greatest luxury is to have a woolen robe or somebody to sleep with it was a brutal existence and under those circumstances in Europe milder winters and longer summers with a longer growing season were an enormous economic boost in a continent that was mostly countryside it was a time however of rapid growth of towns and cities like London and Paris and of rapid population growth and there is no question that there is a tie between warmer climate longer growing seasons more food production and population growth and as a result people expanded into the forests we fly over Europe today or you pound on a train you will see these beautiful green 
countryside, industrial scale agriculture. It's very hard for people to imagine that even a hundred years ago, the appearance of the European countryside was very different because people were living still mainly on small farms. In medieval times, there were enormous tracts of unprimordial forest which had never been cleared since the Ice Age. And between about 1100 and 1300, about a third to half of European forests were cut down and burnt down to acquire new agricultural land. Some of this was encouraged by lords who encouraged their peasants to expand, others by villagers who just cleared forest, others religious houses did a lot of the clearance. But in these two centuries, the landscape of Europe was totally transformed. But much of the agriculture that resulted was done on slopes, and when the rains came in 1315, these slopes were heavily eroded. Much of the soil was marginal, so people starve when their crops fail, which is something that's happening today. And above all, the resources of the forest were lost. Game, plants, and timber. There was 10% less rainfall slightly higher temperatures, and more than half of Europe's forests vanished. The only place you can really see primordial forests today is in Poland. Let's look at some other long-term consequences of the medieval warm period. Everyone thinks of the Norse. They automatically think of Kirk Douglas, and the Vikings. How many of you have seen that movie? What a literate audience you are. Ladies and gentlemen, as an ex-professor, I assign you to go to a video store and see that appallingly bad movie. It's all about warships, orgies, battles, Viking funerals, and people with trumpets. It does the Vikings a gross misjustice. They were, above all, consummate seamen. And most of their voyaging was done not in longships, but in boats like this, canars, merchant vessels, which sailed surprisingly well, which had lap strake hulls, which flexed with the waves. And in these, during the medieval warm period, which was a period when ice retreated from around Iceland, way north, they ventured as far as Iceland in 900. They, of course, went to Greenland. Then they went up down to Labrador and Newfoundland. And very interestingly, they developed a relationship with the Inuit in Baffin land with whom they traded iron. And it is thought that conditions in the north were so warm that some of that Viking iron may even have gone as far west as the Bering Strait. Connections with another world. So this was a favorable outcome. When the Little Ice Age came around 1250 up in the north there, rapidly Greenland became untenable to the Norse who lived on a dairy economy. And they abandoned it and left it to the Inuit. In the compass of time available, I am skipping over all sorts of different subjects with disgusting superficiality, which is the luck of a lecturer. But I want to throw another one at you. This is Clupia horrendous, the Atlantic heron, the most prolific of all fish. They swarm in the millions. And every winter, every spring, they gather in the North Atlantic, north of the North Sea. And then as the summer progresses, they come down the east coast of Scotland and England, and spawn in the southern North Sea, and also off South Sweden. Now, what is not known is anything about the ecology of herrings. How sensitive are they to cold water? And during the medieval warm period, it's most striking that a huge industry in herrings developed. Now, the problem with a herring is that it's a very fatty flesh. 
and this spoils in hours. The way to eat a herring is to catch it and put it straight in the frying pan. Yum, yum, yum. But medieval people didn't do that. They had to salt them. And salting is an enormously difficult process when you were talking about a fish with fatty flesh. And it was about 900 that somebody in Scandinavia developed a way of salting fish in barrels, packing them in barrels, salting them in brine, which was so effective that you could ship these barrels all over Europe. And a huge industry in headings developed over this century, these centuries. Why did it develop? Partly out of a need to feed the urban poor, because the greatest fear of any monarch in those days was unrest in cities. And the second was to satisfy Christian doctrine that you eat fish on Fridays. You laugh, but this was a major industry. And in later centuries, when the Newfoundland cod industry developed, it was fueled almost entirely by the Catholic doctrine that you eat fish on Fridays. Am I boring you or shall I continue? Okay. So there were some benefits. Looking back a thousand years, you can look at the medieval warm period two ways. You can do it like many historians do or climatologists and just look at it like this as a European phenomenon. Whoopee! A time of prosperity, of cathedrals, of forest clearance, of peasants dancing in the streets, blah, 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 blah. But if you look at it globally, you get a very different picture. You get a picture of drought. Not short drought, but prolonged drought. Here, the hyper-arid areas of the world and the arid areas. It is in these areas that the impact of warmer conditions, even slightly warmer, is greatest. And a good example is the Sahara or the Eurasian steppes. Think of your lungs, provided they're not contaminated with cigar smoke. Think of breathing in when the rainfall gets higher, the deserts or semi-arid lands attract people and animals. Why? There is water. But when it gets drier, it pushes them out to the margins. And this was an enormously powerful factor in history over the long term. And when you look at modern anthropogenic warming, we're looking at greater warmth greater droughts, and more push-out of people to the margins of arid lands. The same applies, too, in northern China, where even today people are getting water supplies by tapping ice caps. And what is very interesting is that in recent years they have studied coral rings. Old coral is rather rare. It's very difficult to find. But if you find it, like tree rings, it gives you a proxy record of temperatures and of El Nino events over large areas of the Pacific. And some years ago, a young graduate student was sent on a research vessel to Palmyra Atoll, which is 300 miles southwest of Hawaii. This is nowhere. And in the Pacific, she found a record of corals going back to the medieval warm period. And what she found was that this part of the Pacific, the Eastern Pacific, wasn't warm and moist. It was cool and dry. And not only that, but the periods of low rainfall in her coral coincide exactly with prolonged droughts in the American West, droughts in Central America, which had a profound effect on Maya civilization, droughts in the Andes, droughts in Australia and in Asia. And for the first time, we can see that one of the great villains of the medieval warm period wasn't El Nino, 
It was La Nina, the cold opposite part of La Nina. And it seems very likely that there were major impacts during the medieval warm period on all kinds of civilizations. For example, the Maya. Over a thousand years, the Maya lords became astoundingly expert at conserving water. And their big cities like Tikal here were also giant water catchments with huge systems of reservoirs which irrigated the land around them. And this water was very carefully controlled by the nobles. Each village had its own tanks. But thanks to deep sea cores of Venezuela, which correlate beautifully with the Palmyra core and with other cores in Asia, we know that a set of droughts often found, are also found in freshwater lakes in the Yucatan show that Maya civilization was jolted by long, prolonged droughts at the very moment when we know it collapsed in a wide area. The same is true of Chan Chan, the great Chimor capital on the Peruvian coast, which managed to survive because they had very sophisticated irrigation. Tiwanaku, up on the islands, on the other hand, failed to survive because all its investment was in raised farming. So, a thousand years ago, there were huge droughts. And the word, ladies and gentlemen, is not drought, it's prolonged drought. In a world there were many millions fewer people than there are today. Fast forward to the 19th century. And in the late 19th century, there were a series of massive El Nino events and monsoon failures, which impacted India at the height of the British Raj, at a time when India was exporting grain for the world grain market. Millions of people died. You can see the pictures here. And it is estimated by one historian, and I see no reason at all to doubt his estimate, that during the 19th century, are you ready for this? Between 20 and 30 million people perished as a result of famine and famine-related diseases more than in virtually all the wars of the same century. In a century when the world's population at risk was a fraction of that of today. What the study of climate change in the past does is to use a very broad range of academic disciplines, archaeology, climatology, history, even bugs, all sorts of things to look at what one French historian calls the long durée. Because the point about the past is that it doesn't tell us what the future is going to be, but it shapes not only the future, but the way we think about it. And one of the things that the lesson of the medieval warm period should do, and also the lesson of 19th century famines should do, is to alert us to what I call the silent elephant in the climatic room. There was a huge lot of froth being talked and the chatterers are having a wonderful time talking about global warming, higher temperatures, this and this and this and this, higher sea levels. But the silent elephant that very few people talk about is drought. The Hadley Center, which is a highly respected meteorological center in England, has recently done a computer modeling project. Computer modeling is something people discuss and argue about a lot. And this study gives you a perspective on the medieval droughts I've talked about. And I can only, in a short compass of time, give you an adequate picture. There's been a 25% increase in global drought since 1990. At the moment, only 3% of the world's population suffers from extreme drought, many of them in the Saharan Sahel. And there was a memorable quote in the paper last week from somebody who was yakking about oil in Chad. And some prominent leader said, we don't want oil, we want water. And he was right. 
that severe drought will affect 40% of us, up from 8, and moderate drought, half of humanity. Look at those figures. Even if they're half right, they're frightening. And I wager that some of the major wars of the next centuries will be fought not over petty nationalisms, but over water. Because in today's world, I don't know the exact figure, but at least 300 million people are severely at risk for drought and starvation. And just like the 19th century, many of us are totally oblivious to it. And the challenge of global warming to me isn't frothing about temperatures. It's what the hell are we going to do as a world community about issues which are large, like the hidden elephant, which we don't want to think about, we don't want to spend money on, which require long-term thinking in the perspective of grandchildren and great-grandchildren rather than the next election. Do we have the will as human beings to do this? I can only tell you one thing from the long perspective of the past is that humans are generally very opportunistic, brilliant at adaptation, and have adjusted to incredibly difficult conditions. When there were many few of us and some people say, ah, oh, the technology will do it today. I sometimes wonder if we're at the moment of truth. Because to me, the elephant in the room in long-term thinking, without question, one of the major ones, is drought. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. I think you will agree with me that Brian Fagan's an amazing storyteller. His books are equally wonderful storytelling. I, I, I must confess, I spent my childhood in Norway and grew up on herring. Good uh, for you. That's why you're so healthy. Salted herring. It's a story I would like to forget. Oh, um, I like it. But I, and I love parachutists versus truffle hunters. So just how many parachutists in the room? How many truffle hunters? Mm, more parachutists than truffle hunters. Mm, I don't, so. It, We'll see if the truffle hunter's questions get answered as well. Uh, you said something uh, at the very end I want to actually begin with. Question from me. Uh, drought. So uh, one of the areas that is likely to be affected, well, actually, before I get to the questions, I think uh, all the questions, by the way, I might say, essentially all the questions, all point in the same direction. What everybody wants to know is what you think all this means for today and tomorrow. So that, that every one of these questions in one way or another. Which I've answered. What? Which I've answered, haven't Yes, I? well, we'll explore in a little more detail. I think okay, we'll have a go. Explore. So one of the questions, my question, what's that? Move this out of the way, yeah. Um, Famous occasion when I gave a lecture with a jug of water and finally put vodka in it. <laughs> go on. No, no vodka in there, I think. Alas, no. Uh, one of the areas that is particularly vulnerable to drought is the Tibetan highlands. Mm -hmm. And the Tibetan highlands provide the water for the Indus, the Ganges, the Brahmaputra, the Mekong, the Yellow, and the Yangtze. Mm -hmm. Approximately two and a half billion people depend upon the waters of the Tibetan highlands. And many of those folks haven't liked each other much in the past. Um, what risk do you see that the kind of drought that you foresee will be the trigger to the conflicts along the Mekong, along the Indus? Along I think it's very high indeed. Because um, you've got cases where people now are damming rivers, and that also is the environment. You've got the Nile, where they're now damming in the Sudan. Uh, and the governments that live upstream control it. And I think the, the, uh, the potential of conflict is enormous. It's very frightening. And that's something we can't do much about. We're kind of reaching a moment in, in, in history where the scale of everything is so much larger. And it's always overwhelming. It really well, is. actually, that brings us to one of the questions. Um, Stephen Fleming, where are you? Over here. So uh, L. Neil Smith, whom I'm not sure who that is. Do you know who that is? Who's L. Neil Smith? A historian and author. A historian and author. Uh, 
said, considering all the consequences, the invention of agriculture may be the worst mistake in human history. What do you think? I don't think you can consider it, oddly enough, a deliberate act. The way it seems to have come about, and there's been eon, I mean, acres of literature on the subject, is that in areas where plant foods, wild plant foods, became scarcer during the Younger Dryas drought, or when populations reached a certain critical point, you're talking carrying capacity of the land, people started to plant. Now, they didn't plant to say, I'm going to become a farmer. They planted to get more food in a logical extension, because as I said, they want to preserve their life. And they made decisions in good faith to try and preserve their life, the long-term consequences of which you couldn't possibly tell. It's rather like building the Aswan Dam. It was built, and the environmental consequences have been simply horrible. Um, generations make decisions in good faith within the context of the life they're living. And that's what happened here. The results, I agree, are not necessarily a good thing. But let us not idealize the hunter-gatherer life. It was tough. Though, you know, the, the argument has been made recently that uh, we would have entered an ice age, say, 3,000 years ago, were it not for Chinese discovery of terraced rice agriculture and the process of the rice hulls decaying, producing methane, producing greenhouse gases, and thereby warming, preventing the onset of another ice age. Have you been reading Rudiman? Have I been reading what? Reading Rudiman. Rudiman, yes. Yeah. He's very controversial. Um, There are people who are detecting signs of releases of fresh water in the North Atlantic now. Right. I, I kind of feel he's stretched that a bit. I think it really probably is the Industrial Revolution, which is the main one. So Matthew McClure asks, where's Matthew? Hello. Where, where, where are you, Matthew? He's over there. Way back there. Oh, yeah. Hi, Matthew. Uh, so does your experience in archaeology and anthropology suggest anything about the sustainable carrying capacity of the planet and its fragility in the light of climate change? Well, you ask big questions, don't you? Um, You're taking the long view. Yeah, yes. I really, so far, over the long haul of history up to now, people have come up with solutions the price in human life has been enormous. I think it really ultimately comes down, and I hate to come back to this, to water, because water is the one thing we can't control. And I don't know if you've recently been to Las Vegas or to Tucson or to Phoenix. It is truly frightening, let alone Bakersfield. Um, we are living on borrowed time. And all you've got to do is go to Owens Lake and see it. And to me, it comes down to one word, water. And up to now, human societies have coped. How much longer can we cope? Yeah, Short almost, of desalinization. Yeah, almost all our research suggests, that, uh, the research at GBN, that the mechanism of transmission of climate effects is water, whether it's hyper-severe yep. rains yep. or floods or rising sea level or it drought. All comes water. Water. It all comes down to water. It all comes down to water. And as populations grow, more and more people live in marginal lands. So my answer is it comes down to water. But it's a good question. So rate of change. There's lots of reasons. You showed a chart that shows the rate of change of climate apparently accelerating. Oh, what uh, up the hockey stick, yes. Uh, yes, yes. And uh, there's good reason to believe that it may be increasing. So how does that relate to our rate of adaptation, our ability to adapt? Uh, do we have the ability to adapt at an accelerating rate? No, I don't think we do. I think it's very interesting because somewhere, I, I, I'm a sailor, and occasionally I go sailing in small yachts. And one of the most memorable experiences I ever had was to ship out on an 830-foot container ship with the pilot out of the Golden Gate. For that boat to have steerage way, he has to sail at 12 knots, which is about 15 to 18 miles an hour, just to be able to maneuver. And he could see a quarter of a mile in front of the bow. He couldn't see anything because the ship's so high. 
and a yacht sailed so close to us we couldn't see it anymore. And I said to the pilot, what are we going to do? And he just looked at me and said, nothing. There's nothing I can do. It takes me two miles to stop the ship. We live in a large, industrial, cumbersome civilization. Our ability to respond rapidly to anything, let alone to move people, which is one of the most effective strategies for coping with population change, population with uh, climate change, has reduced drastically. Just look, I hate to bring it up, at Hurricane Katrina. It's yeah. frightening. And we're and already seeing the insurance companies not being willing to write. Coastal. And you can't blame them. You cannot entirely blame them. And because if there's one thing most global warming people I've talked to agree on, we're going to see more extreme weather events. And imagine a Category 5 hurricane in the middle of Miami Beach. It isn't imagine. It's going to happen one day. Maybe not in our lifetimes, but it's going to happen. Oh, it might happen, I think, well within our lifetimes. Uh, but, you know, one, you talked about, for example, the, the, the example of the Peruvian society that collapsed in a matter of days. Uh, we've talked about, on the other hand, uh, parts of European society that adapted in an opportunistic way toward warming and, and moved northwards and so on. But now you've, 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 you've talked about a fairly brittle modern civilization. How would you compare our flexibility and adaptability to earlier societies? Early societies. Uh, by the way, that was a question from Noah. Where's Noah? Noah Flower, right here. It's, it comes back again to the question of the number of people on Earth. Both you and I are old enough to remember a much emptier world. About half. Yeah. And I remember, and I go back to this novice example, going sailing in the English Channel in August and going to a harbor in the Channel Islands, and we were the only boat there. I went back in 1995, and there was no space. And we're in the same situation. There's so many of us now that we can't adapt easily. The most powerful lesson that's come out of Katrina, to me, reading superficially, is the most powerful weapon people have are their own friends and relatives. And in the final analysis, that's what makes societies adapt successfully. And urban societies are so anonymous, it's very different. Very, very different. Well, now we're talking about moving on from simply adapt, adapting. So this is from Stephen Someone, no last name. Like Bond, James right. Bond. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he doesn't have to say James Bond. No, no. Uh, what is your view on human efforts to attain, attenuate climate change, such as carbon drawdown, or efforts to sustain the thermohaline cycle? Are these efforts futile? Who was that? Right there. Stephen who? Thank you, Stephen Magnuson. I hate to tell you, I don't know. I'm not, I'm just an archaeologist. I'm studying the long view of climate change. I frankly have not kept up with um, what's going on. My impression is that anything that's tried should be tried, and if it doesn't work, we move on. The problem is, and I think the most fascinating thing is, the, the, the real impetus for a lot of this is coming from government. It's not coming from governments, it's coming from business, which is the way it's going to happen. I don't think we've got the political will. We are all looking at the next election rather than looking 100 years down the line. I'm not optimistic. Uh, a lot of these questions is just not my thing. Yes. Uh, well, here's a historical question. Given your example of how it took a strict provincial leadership uh, for Egypt to survive, um, are we going to need a uh, strict father here? I once talked about ancient emergencies, believe it or not, to a conference of emergency preparedness technicians just after Katrina. And the presentation after mine was by a group of people who'd been down there, and they showed the pictures. And these included corpses and everything. It was very harrowing. And I said, I told them this example, and I said the most important thing is very resolute le leadership at the local level and at the top. And there were loud applause and cheers. This audience was an angry audience, not with me. And I just said, ladies and gentlemen, you thought it, I thought it, but I didn't say it. 
because one lesson you learn from Egypt, and you learn from a lot of these things, that the people who really are good at leadership in situations like this are the people who are in touch with the local communities, who have relatives in the local communities, who really know what makes them function. And that was the lesson of Egypt. And the pharaohs were useless. The later pharaohs, different matter, they really invested in storage, they invested in irrigation, and they changed the ideology from being the supreme god who was infallible to being shepherds of the people. And they learned. We've got a lot to learn about it. Uh, so, so do we need to plan for the seven lean years and we need to be putting up uh, our supplies for that? It isn't us. It's them. And the point is we ignore them. Who's them? The people living in marginal lands, lands. people living in drought prone lands, uh, the developing world. That's where the problem is going to be. And you're going to get issues of migration, involuntary migration. You're almost going to get migration wars. You can get that bad. You're talking about enormous numbers of people, and most people's consciousness of this, and believe me, I'm not preaching, is zero. Well, in fact, our research, you take a look at places like Haiti, whose ecosystems are already shattered, parts of Central America similarly, and they get hit with mega droughts or ultra-severe storms, and we are going to have large numbers of people washing up on our shores. Bangladesh, sea level, gets hit with big monsoons, and you're going to have 100 million Bangladeshis coming to visit Pakistan, uh, India and China, and not particularly welcome. And the Sahel is the classic. Oh, yeah, I mean, you're talking things that frighten the hell out of me. So Kevin Kelly wants to know, um, our own Kevin, I assume that's you, Kevin, right? Okay. Uh, in periods of large-scale prolonged drought, where does the water go? Does it always mean that it's, you know, if it's warm and dry somewhere, it's going to be cold and wet somewhere else? Or is, is there always a balancing out somewhere in the world? Not necessarily, no. No? no. If you look at the uh, global effects of El Ninos, classically, major El Ninos, there's drought in Southeast Asia and Indonesia, there's drought in Northeast Brazil, there's drought in Central America, Peru gets more rain, we get more rain. It's patchy, but generally it, the biggest impact is drought. So this is the last question. Um, it's the bottom line question. Do you have children? Do you have children? I have two. Two. Okay. You, you may even have grandchildren soon? Me? Don't know. I said soon. Soon. I have, no, no. A long way. One of my daughters actually lives in San Francisco. Ah. Well, in any event, if you were going to... Uh, if, If you were going to tell, advise your children, your grandchildren, where to live, you told us we're going to move. Where should they go live? I don't know. An interesting question, isn't it? The Midwest, probably. No, I have no idea. Probably Canada. Probably Canada. It's going to get nicer and warmer. We'll have some because Canada front. has a much more civilized views on a lot of things in society over here. And actually, if there's warming, Canada will benefit. This will get drier. That will get better. Yeah, we're going to have beachfront property on Hudson's Bay. That's right. So we'll take our vacations together on Hudson's Bay in the middle of the next century. Yeah. Thank you, Brian Fagan. Thank you.